So we can begin now. Um, in the lecture of the neuroanatomy, or basically anatomy of the nervous system, there are a number of topics to cover. I have tried to divide it into sections. And these are the sections that we'll be covering. Today, we are going to cover on introduction to the nervous system. We are also going to cover the basic parts of the cranial cavity, meninges, and the brain. That is what we are going to do today. But section three would be focusing on functional localization of the cerebral cortex. That will be a lecture of its own. We'll also have another lecture of its own that will be focusing on what we call the basal ganglia, the dencephalon, and the cerebellum. That is usually a bit short. It can be combined with number five, which is concerned with brainstem and the cranial nerves. But if it's a short time, we can still split them. After that, we'll talk about anatomy of the spinal cord. That one will tend to be a bit long, so it will be on its own. We'll also have a lecture on cerebrospinal fluid and the ventricular system. That one is a bit short. It can be combined by something. And then the last one, it's like two in one, development of the central nervous system as well as congenital malformations of the central nervous system. I will not really teach you development of the central nervous system. This one you'll read on your own, but we'll have a discussion after you've read. Then now we'll look at congenital malformations of the central nervous system. So between today and wherever we'll do that, you can start reading on development of the central nervous system. Perhaps we'll do it in about three or four weeks time. That's when we'll get there. So you still have enough time to, to just go around it. No emergency about it. After we've done this lecture series that are focusing on the central nervous system, still under neuroanatomy, we will look at uh, what we call sensory systems. In the sensory systems, we look at organization of the sensory system, where we'll be talking about sensory receptors, we'll be talking about sensory organs, and we'll be talking about their sensory pathways. So basically, that's the whole package of neuroanatomy. So for today, we look at the first se section of neuroanatomy, which is going to focus on introduction to the nervous system. This will be a light lecture for you because most of what is here is what you've actually done. So a lot of this will be just revision. We are going to state the role of the nervous system. We are also going to outline the divisions and subdivisions of the nervous system. After that, we look at the components of nervous tissue. And this is one of those that you've actually done. So we'll just rush through it in brief. We'll also look at types of neuroglial cells and their functions. Again, you remember you've done that one. So it will just be in passing. Number five, you've also done. Again, we'll do it in passing structure and classification of neuron. But perhaps something you've not done that we'll also do is to differentiate between gray matter and white matter. So this is what this first part of the lecture entails. Let's look at um, the role of the nervous system. 
So the primary function of the nervous system is to coordinate and integrate body functions. The nervous system coordinates and integrates body functions. The nervous system together with the endocrine system are the systems that we consider as the integrative systems because they do coordinate and integrate body functions. Perhaps you then ask yourself, how does the nervous system achieve this particular role? And to answer that question, the nervous system achieves this particular role of coordination and regulation of body functions through this particular functional model that I want to describe for you. The nervous system uses what we call sensory receptors. Sensory receptors are specialized neuron or epithelial cells that detect environmental stimuli. The fundamental thing about sensory receptors is that they detect environmental stimuli irrespective of the type of the stimulus. A sensory receptor must convert that stimulus into an action potential or what you call nerve impulses. So anything that converts an environmental energy into nerve impulses qualify to be called a sensory receptor. And, and if something cannot convert environmental stimuli into action potentials, then it does not qualify to be called a sensory receptors. So think of any form of environmental stimuli, whether it's light, whether it's heat, whether it's vibration, whether it's touch, whatever form of environmental stimuli, if something can convert that stimulus into a nerve impulse that is a sensor receptor, a sensor receptor. So therefore, sensor receptors convert environmental stimuli into nerve impulses. And what do they do with these nerve impulses? They carry these nerve impulses from those sensory receptors to the cerebral cortex. I will be defining what cerebral cortex is later, but for now, let's take it as the the highest point in the central nervous system. The system of neurons that carry the signals from sensory receptors to the cerebral cortex are called the afferent nerves or the sensory nerves. So this information carried from the sensory receptors to the cerebral cortex using sensory nerves. Now, you don't just have a single neuron that comes from sensory receptor to the cerebral cortex. As a matter of fact, it is a relay of three neurons. It's a relay of three neurons. These three neurons are organized this way. We have what we call first order neuron. First order sensory neuron carry information from the sensory receptor to the spinal cord or to the brainstem. What is important to note about the first order sensory neuron is that its cell body will tend to be outside the central nervous system. The cell body of the first order sensory neuron is usually outside the central nervous system. So the dendrite will come from the receptor, then all the way to the cell body, then the axon of that neuron is the one that enters the central nervous system. It can either terminate within the spinal cord or within the brainstem. That's the end of the first order sensory neuron. That neuron synapses with the second order sensory neuron. The second order sensory neuron therefore starts from where the first order sensory neuron left. But what is important to note about second order sensory neuron 
are two things. One of them is that the second order neuron decassette. To decassette is to cross over. It means that if the second order sensory neuron was on the left side, it goes to the right. If it was on the right side, it goes to the left. The spelling of decassette is D E C U double S A T E, decassette. To decassette is to cross over. We particularly do not know why they decassette, but at least we know the implications of the decassation. One of the implications is that uh, at least because of this decassation, the left side of the brain would tend to control the right side of the body and the right side of the brain will tend to control the left side of the body. There's that crossing. Perhaps the other advantage of the decassation is that because of the decassation, at least the left and the right side of the brain or generally the central nervous system is held together. I mean, if they were just running parallel, these neurons it could have been easy to separate, perhaps to be a weak structure, so to speak. Those are just postulations, however. So one thing I want you to note about the second order sensory neuron is that the second order sensory neuron decassettes. The second thing I want you to note about the second order sensory neuron is that the second order sensory neuron reaches a region in the brain we call the thalamus. Again, we'll be defining shortly what the thalamus is, but for now, let's leave it at that. From the thalamus, there is a third order sensory neuron. The third order sensory neuron arises from the thalamus to the cerebral cortex. We can call that thalamocortical projection. Thalamocortical projection. A third order sensory neuron is a thalamocortical projection from the thalamus to the cerebral cortex. That is how sensation will travel from the sensory receptor to the cerebral cortex a relay of three types of neurons. You want to ask yourself what the cerebral cortex does with that information. And among many things that cerebral cortex can do with that information, three of them stand out. One of them is that the cerebral cortex will interpret that particular sensation. So remember what is going into the cerebral cortex is nerve impulses in form of uh, action potentials. So when it reaches the cerebral cortex, the cerebral cortex will interpret it. If it is pain, it will interpret it as pain. If it is heat, it will interpret it as heat. If it is vibration, it will interpret it as vibration. So interpretation occurs in the cerebral cortex. The second thing that occurs in the cerebral cortex is memory the cerebral cortex keeps memory of the sensation. It explains why, therefore, you remember that this is painful, this is not safe, and things like that. A baby is able to remember that this is fire, they can't play with it again. They just need to do that once or perhaps a few times. So the cerebral cortex keeps memory of a particular sensation. And thirdly, the cerebral cortex provides a response. It provides a reaction to the sensation. The reaction is in form of a response to the sensation that came in. Now, this reaction must then be affected by what we call the effectors the reaction must be executed by the effectors. And so therefore, there'll be a system of neurons that will be coming from the cerebral cortex to the effectors. What are we calling the effectors? The effectors will be muscles or glands. Remember, muscles respond by contracting. 
glands respond by providing some secretions. Just like this journey on your left hand side, which is not one neuron up to there, also on this other side is not one neuron. However, it's also not three. There are two neurons. It's a relay of two neurons. The neuron that comes from the cerebral cortex is known as the upper motor neuron. That neuron will come from the cerebral cortex and terminate somewhere in the brainstem if it's targeting cranial nerves or in the spinal cord if it's targeting spinal nerves. That neuron is called the upper motor neuron. What is important to note about upper motor neuron is that the upper motor neuron also decassettes. The upper motor neuron decassettes. I told you to decassette is to cross over. So if this neuron was coming from the left side of the brain, it will terminate on the right side of the brain stem or the right side of the spinal cord. If it was coming from the right side of the brain, then it will terminate on the left side of the brain stem or spinal cord. From the brain stem or the spinal cord, we have what you call the lower motor neuron. The lower motor neuron is the one that come from the brain stem or the spinal cord to reach the effector. This is what you'll either is call a motor, sorry, a spinal nerve or a cranial nerve. It's coming from the brain stem, you call it cranial nerve. If it's coming from the spinal cord, you call it spinal nerve. This is the organization of the motor system. This is the organization of the sensory system. It is through this model that the nervous system is able to control and to regulate body function. So for example, if you're walking and you feel some sweet smelling aroma, of course your receptors for smell will detect that. And that information go to the cerebral cortex. Of course, it will interpret it as smelling sweet. Perhaps you keep memory or it has already reminded you of something you ate a while back. You respond by perhaps salivating or if you're walking and you step on a sharp thing, again, that information go to the brain, you interpret, you keep memory, you then decide to withdraw your foot. The nervous system has controlled and regulated body functions. Let's look at the divisions of the nervous system. Anatomically, we can divide the nervous system into two. We have the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. When you talk of the central nervous system, we are referring to the brain and the spinal cord. The brain is located within the cranial cavity. The spinal cord is located within the vertebral canal. That is central nervous system. When you talk of peripheral nervous system, we are referring to the nerves. Nerves are neuron, a group of neuronal processes that are outside the brain and spinal cord. A group of neuronal processes that are outside the central nervous system. That is what we call nerves. A group of neuronal processes outside the CNS. Now, let's narrow down to this one, peripheral nervous system. There are two ways in which we can classify the peripheral nervous system. We can divide the peripheral nervous system anatomically, we can also divide it functionally. The anatomical division of the peripheral nervous system is based on the origin of the nerves. If the nerves come from the brain then we call these nerves cranial nerves. We have a total of 12 pairs of cranial nerves. From today, henceforth, I want you to be reading them. Maybe today I'll not give you their names, but with the time, by the time you're finishing your anatomy, 
you'll be knowing all the cranial nerves with their functions, what they do. So what I want you to do is between now and that time that we'll be learning them, start knowing cranial nerves. Maybe you can work on two per day. By the time the week is ending, you'll have known all the 12 cranial nerves. Okay, if the nerves don't come from the brain, they're coming from the spinal cord. If they come from the spinal cord, we call them spinal nerves. Now, cranial nerves are 12 pairs. We have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. In as much as they sound so many, they're the ones that are easier to know. They're the ones that are easier to name. Their naming system is much simpler than the cranial nerves. Again, I'll be teaching you their naming system much later when you look at the spinal cord. But for now, I want you to know that we have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. We have 12 pairs of cranial nerves. So that is anatomical division. The functional division of the peripheral nervous system is based on the direction of the nerve impulses within those nerves. If the nerve impulse is towards the central nervous system, then we call it the afferent division of the nervous system. The afferent division serve a sensory function. So you can therefore call the sensory division. If the nerve impulses are away from the central nervous system, then we call it the efferent division. The efferent division is what we call the motor division. Remember, the afferent division carry impulses from sensory receptors to the central nervous system. The efferent division carry information that is supposed to be executed from the central nervous system to the effectors. So this is afferent, this is efferent division. Let's narrow down on that efferent division of the nervous system. When we talk of the efferent division of the nervous system, we are referring to the nerve supply to effector organs. In this case, we've mentioned that the effector organs are muscles and glands. The glands we're talking about here are exocrine glands, glands which provide secretions, fluid secretions for that matter. We divide the efferent division of the nervous system based on how the central nervous system control these effectors. If the central nervous system is controlling these effectors voluntarily, which means it is within the consciousness of the individual, then we give it the name somatic nervous system. The division of the nervous system that controls the effectors voluntarily is what you're calling somatic nervous system. The type of effectors that will fall under this category are skeletal muscles. And that is why when we were looking at basic tissues one time, we mentioned that skeletal muscles are voluntary. Now, if the nervous system is controlling these effectors subconsciously, then we call it the involuntary control. The involuntary division of the nervous system is what is otherwise known as the autonomic nervous system. When you talk of autonomic nervous system, we are not talking about skeletal muscles. Let me give you some 10 seconds to list three types of targets of autonomic nervous system. Okay, you should be having something in your mind. So let's review what you've said. 
we have said that we have an atomic division of the nervous system, which can be divided into central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. When you talk of central nervous system, we are referring to the brain and the spinal cord. When you talk of peripheral nervous system, you're referring to cranial nerves and spinal nerves. That is anatomical division. But we're also saying you can divide the nervous system functionally into the afferent division and the efferent division. The afferent division is concerned with sensations. Generally, we can divide the type of sensations which go to the sub, uh, to the central nervous system into two. There are those that we call special sensations, and there are those that we call general sensations. What are special sensations? Special sensations are five. We have the sense of sight. We have the sense of smell, the sense of taste, the sense of hearing, and the sense of equilibrium of the head. Those are special sensations. What is unique about special sensations? is that their receptor organs are housed within the skull. And the sensations carried from these ones are conveyed via the cranial nerves. As opposed to general sensations, which their receptors are not limited to the head region. The receptor organs are, fine, are found much beyond the head region in as much as they could also be in the head region. So sensations such as pain, temperature, which means heat and cold. Tactile sensation is what we call touch sensation. Pressure, vibration, and I want you to add another one here in this list proprioception, pain, temperature, touch, pressure, vibration, and proprioception are general sensations. Their sensory receptors are not limited to the head region and therefore also are not limited to being conveyed by only the cranial nerves. They can also be conveyed by spinal nerves. Please take note that uh, that thing of we have five common senses might not be making sense right now because we've just mentioned over 10 type of sensations today. Also take note that touch is not special sensation, even if it could be from a special person to you. Okay. Let's talk about the efferent division of the nervous system. The efferent division of the nervous system, we've mentioned that we can divide it into somatic nervous system and autonomic nervous system. When you talk of somatic nervous system, you are referring to the division of the nervous system that innervates skeletal muscles. So it is voluntary. When you talk of the autonomic nervous system, you are referring to the division of the nervous system that innervates smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, and glands. You can now mark that on your end. This division of the nervous system is involuntary. Good. I want to ask you a question that I want you to answer in the poll. So I've launched the poll for you and you have one minute. So your time is up. 
Uh, some two people haven't responded. Okay, one person is here to respond. Okay, everyone has responded. So, um, anatomy ningumu. We've agreed that um, autonomic nervous system targets smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, and glands. So irrespective of whatever you wrote, let's relook at this list again. And let's ask ourselves which one out of these six options does not rely on either smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or gland. So any volunteer, which one will it be? No volunteer, we proceed. Okay. You'll tell me one day, no problem. Let's review components of nervous tissue. We talked about components of nervous tissue some time back, <clears throat> and we agreed that uh, Nervous tissue consists of neurons and neuroglial cells. There were a number of differences between neurons and neuroglial cells. One of those differences was based on the role of these types of cells. Neurons are the functional cells of the nervous tissue. Neuroglial cells are the supporting cells of the nervous tissue. The other difference is based on excitability. Remember, excitability is the ability to generate electrical impulses in form of action potentials. On this note, neurons are excitable, which means they can generate electrical impulses. Neuroglial cells are not excitable. They cannot generate electrical impulses. The third difference is based on the renewal potential and on this note, we say that uh, neurons are non-renewing. They are largely in the G0 phase of the cell cycle. They do not undergo mitosis, at least not many of them. On the other hand, neuroglial cells are actively renewing. They are dividing cells. They are within the cell cycle. The other difference, therefore, is on the number of these cells. Usually, neurons are fewer than neuroglial cells. And as a matter of fact, the neurons that you are born with are more than the neurons you have right now because a number of the neurons have died. But that's not so for neuroglial cells, where in as much as usually there are more than neurons, also, their numbers are increasing. So the ones you have right now are definitely more than the ones you're born with. At the time of birth, perhaps for every one neuron, you have about 10 neuroglial cells. When we reach adulthood, perhaps for every one neuron, there are about 50 neuroglial cells. I'm giving you a second question. Again, I want you to answer it in the poll. The question is with you now.
You have one minute for it. Right, your time is up. Okay. I'm looking at your results and I'm starting to believe that uh, a number of you are not really reading or at least are not serious. Now that will cost you one day, but not to worry. I'll do my part. <clears throat> so, I don't know why you're failing this question. We've done this before. We agreed that uh, we have two types of cells that cause myelination, Schwann cells and oligodendrocytes. And despite that, people are still mentioning other cells even outside those ones as causing myelination. All right. Schwann cells cause myelination within the peripheral nervous system. Oligodendrocytes cause myelination within the central nervous system. Now you can make your judgment based on that. So who wants to offer the correct response? Anyone? Yes. Mm -hmm. Schwann cells. Okay, very good, Schwann cells. And the reason is because cranial nerves are part of the peripheral nervous system. We just say that one. I've seen many people choosing oligodendrocytes. Cranial nerves are part of the peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system is brain and spinal cord. So the correct response here is that one. Okay, so someone has asked that, uh, she's seen somewhere that uh, neurons can be renewing. And I agree with you. And that is why I put that statement with asteric. And I say that at least not majority of neurons. Postnatal neurogenesis is something that has been described, but there are few parts of the central nervous system that can undergo postnatal neurogenesis. Otherwise, largely, most neurons cannot divide. All right. So let's talk about types of neuroglial cells. We had done this before, so allow me to just rush through this quickly. We agree that uh, neuroglial cells can be divided into two. The ones found in the central nervous system are called central neuroglia. The one from the peripheral nervous system are called peripheral neuroglia. The central neuroglia include astrocytes. Astrocytes provide structural support to neurons. They also form the blood-brain barrier they are important during healing within the CNS, and they also modulate neurotransmission by uptaking excess neurotransmitter from the synaptic clefts. Oligodendrocytes form myelin sheath around the axons of neurons within the central nervous system. And what is important for you to note is that one oligodendrocyte will myelinate multiple axons, as you can see in this case. The pendymal cells line the brain ventricles as well as the central canal of the spinal cord. Now they're important in secretion of CSF, but they also promote the flow of CSF because of the ciliary activity of the ependymal cells and especially the ones on the central canal of the spinal cord. Microglial cells are macrophages within the central nervous system. 
They offer defense against infective organisms. They also clear debris within the central nervous system. So those are central neuroglia. Then you have peripheral neuroglia. Peripheral neuroglia are found within the peripheral nervous system. I gave you two of them. Schwann cells form myelin sheath around axons of neurons within the peripheral nervous system. And what is important to note is that one Schwann cell myelinates one axon. The other peripheral neuroglia are the neurosatellite cells. Neurosatellite cells surround the cell bodies of neurons within the peripheral nervous system. They provide structural and nutritional support to neurons. Now let's talk about neurons. Neurons, we agreed that neurons have two key functional properties. Excitability is the ability of a cell to generate electrical impulses, and neurons can do that. Conductivity is the ability of a cell to conduct electrical impulses along the cell membrane, and neurons can do that. You'll remember that even muscles could do this, except that muscles can contract and neurons cannot contract. Muscles can also stretch and neurons cannot stretch. I don't think I want to give you that as a class exercise because we had already done this a while back. So let me skip that. But we know that that's how a neuron looks like. There'll be a cell body, there'll be an axon, the dendrites. The axon could be myelinated and the junction between one sheath of myelination and another one is what we call the node of Ranvier. The ends of the axons are what you're calling terminal buttons. In its basic structure, we describe a neuron as having three function domains, the receptive domain being the dendrites, the integration domain being the cell body, or others called the soma, and the transmission or transport domain being the axon of the neuron. We also talked about how we classify neurons and we agreed on structural and functional classification of neuron. Today I'll review those ones, but I'll also add you two more ways in which we classify neurons. So one way of classifying neurons is structural classification, which is based on the number of processes that arise from the neuronal cell body. So in that case, if you have multiple processes arising from the cell body like this one where we have, in this case, five dendrites and one axon, so six processes arising from the cell body, we call this multipolar neuron. If there are two processes arising from the cell body, one axonal, the other dendritic, we call this bipolar neuron. If a single process is arising from the cell body but it seems to divide immediately, like in this case, we call this pseudo unipolar neuron. We clarified on where they were found. Pseudo unipolar neurons are primary or what we call first order sensory neurons. Pseudo unipolar neurons are first order sensory neurons for receptors of general sensations. Give me a second, please. Sorry, Ada visitor, we can proceed now. So I've told you that pseudonipolar neurons are first order sensory neurons from receptors of general sensations. Their cell bodies will be outside the central nervous system in most cases. Bipolar neurons look like this. These are, these tend to be first order neurons from receptors such as that of vision and that of smell. First order sensory neurons from, for the sense of vision, the sense of smell. Multipolar neurons look like this. These ones are 
either motor neurons or they are interneurons. Apart from those three, the other two types that you may come across are polar neurons and unipolar neuron. This is how a unipolar neuron would look like. And this is how a polar neuron would look like. These ones tend to be in the primitive stages of neuronal uh, differentiation. So you'll see them mainly in embryonic cells as what we call neuroblasts. Okay, the functional classification of neurons is based on the direction of nerve impulses with respect to the central nervous system. So if it's carrying impulses from the receptor to the central nervous system, then you call it afferent neuron. An afferent neuron is a sensory neuron, like in this case. If it's carrying impulses from the central nervous system to the effector, then you call it efferent neuron. An efferent neuron is a motor neuron. But the third situation is it could be joining two neurons within the central nervous system. If it is linking two or more neurons within the central nervous system, then we call it an interneuron. An interneuron is an association neuron. So that is functional classification. I promised you that I'll teach you two other forms of classification of neuron. So the third way in which you can classify neuron is based on myelination. If the neuron is myelinated, then you call it myelinated neuron. If the neuron does not have myelin sheet around it, then you call it unmyelinated neuron. The myelinated neurons will tend to have to be faster because they have myelin sheet around them. The unmyelinated neurons are slower. Remember the gaps between the myelin sheets, these ones are what we call the nodes of Ranvi. Okay, so while we are there, I want to ask you a third question. So that's the third question. This one, I'll give you one and a half minutes because it's a bit long. Okay, you have the question already, you can respond. Okay, I should be finishing. You've already burned two minutes. I think I'll close it now. So this one is also not well done, but this is understandable. This one I don't mind explaining. So we've agreed that uh, Peripheral myelination is done by Schwann cells and central myelination is done by oligodendrocytes, which means choice A is correct. <clears throat> We've also agreed that in peripheral myelination, one Schwann cell can only myelinate a single axon, while in the central nervous system, an oligodendrocyte myelinates multiple axons. So choice E is also correct. So we are debating among these three. Now, let me ask you, what is saltatory conduction? 
Anyone? Um, it describes how an impulse skips from one node to another. Very good. So is there skipping or the jumping of action potential impulses from one node of runway to the next? That does not change. As long as a neuron is myelinated, they'll have saltatory conduction. And so that would be the correct response. The sizes of the nodes of Ranvi vary depending on whether you are in the central or peripheral nervous system. So I'll give you a chance to go check which one has larger nodes of Ranvi, which ones have smaller nodes of Ranvi. Also the type of myelin proteins in the central nervous system are different from the type of myelin proteins in the peripheral nervous system. It explains to you why some diseases that attack myelin sheath are only limited to the CNS, while also some diseases that attack myelin sheath are only limited to the peripheral nervous system. So here the correct response is saltatory conduction, which the jumping of action potential from one node of runway to the next doesn't matter where that myelination is. As long as a neuron is myelinated, it will have a saltatory conduction. And we don't have different types of saltatory conduction. OK. <clears throat> the fourth way in which we classify neurons is based on the axonal diameter, the diameter of the axon. On, based on this one, there are two naming systems. This is what we call type A, type B, and type C neurons in the decreasing order of their cross-sectional area. As you can see in this column, the type A's are even four types, A alpha, A beta, A gamma, A delta. So these ones are based on cross-sectional area, A alpha being the widest, type C being the narrowest. This is another naming system which recognizes them as type one, type two, type three, and type four. My intention is not really to give you the measurements, but to pass this message that the wider the neuron, the faster <clears throat> the speed of impulse conduction. The narrower the neuron, the slower the speed at which it will be conducting the impulses. That's a message here. Right, let's finish this introductory part by defining what is gray matter and what is white matter. So I'm showing images of gray and white matter. <clears throat> In the spinal cord, gray matter is inside and white matter is outside. In the brain, you have gray matter which is outside and white matter inside, but you can still have gray matter within the white matter, like here. So let's define this matter. We begin with the gray matter. Gray matter represents a collection of neuronal cell bodies. A collection of neuronal cell bodies is what constitutes the gray matter. There are different varieties of gray matter. This is what we call the cortex. This is the cortex. The cortex represents the gray matter in the periphery of the central nervous system. Gray matter in the periphery of the central nervous system or in the outer layer of the central nervous system. It 
if that gray matter is on the cerebrum, then we call it cerebral cortex. <clears throat> if that cortex is on the cerebellum, then we call it cerebellar cortex. We also have what you call a nucleus. A nucleus is gray matter within the white matter of the central nervous system. Like this one is a nucleus. Gray matter within the white matter of the central nervous system. So it's gray within white matter. It is not in the periphery like here, this is cortical, but this is not cortical. This is gray matter, which is not in the periphery. So it's not cortex, this is a nucleus. Then you have what you call a ganglion. A ganglion is gray matter outside the central nervous system or Keep it simple. It's a collection of cell bodies of neurons within the peripheral nervous system. There are two types of ganglia. The plural of ganglion is ganglia. There are two types of ganglia. The ganglia formed by autonomic nerves are called autonomic ganglia, like the ones I'm pointing at. You can see those nodular collections, those are collections of cell bodies of neurons. So they are ganglia. But because these are autonomic nerves, there you just believe me, so we call this autonomic ganglia. You can also have where we have a collection of the pseudo neurons. So if it's a collection of pseudo neurons, then you call it sensory ganglion because pseudonipolar neurons are sensory neurons. How about white matter? White matter refers to a collection of axonal fibers, a collection of axons of fibers. The axonal fibers can take different names depending on how they are running. So they're the ones that form what we call tracts. A tract is a group of axonal fibers which have the same function. A group of axonal fibers that have the same function, we call that a tract. For example, there could be axons that carry pain sensation. That's a tract different from axons that carry vibration sensation. That's another tract. Different from axons that carry the sensation regarding vision, that would be another tract. So a tract is a group of axons with the same function. A peduncle is a collection of different tracts. So it's just a mass that contain different tracts. That's what we call a peduncle. And especially you'll find that in the brain, call that peduncle. Now, with regard to the white matter of the cerebrum here, with regard to the white matter in the brain, let me say so for now, there are three varieties of fibers. There are those that we call projection. When you use the term fiber, it means just neuronal processes. There are three types of fibers. We have what we call projection fibers. Projection fibers refer to fibers that connect the cerebral cortex to regions which are outside the cerebral cortex, like these green ones. So assume these are neurons. Let's assume their cell bodies are here in the cortex. Then the axons project that way. 
So either that way or up to there. As long as it's from the cortex to regions which are not part of the cortex, that becomes a projection fiber. As opposed to association fibers, which represent neurons, which come from one cortical region to another cortical region within the same side. So like this one coming from this cortex to that cortex, different cortical regions within the same side, we call that association fiber. Also different from commissure of fibers. Commissure of fibers connect similar cortical regions between the right and the left side. They connect similar cortical regions between the right and the left side. Those are commissure of fibers. So that is white matter. And that marks the end of that introductory part. So if you have a question, you can ask before I give you a break. <laughs>